Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to Greg Tech New Horizons. In the last episode, we built ore processing here again in a very, very long video. Thank you guys for all the support on that episode. I had a really good time putting it together. And uh, yeah, really pleased with how the ore processing system here has turned out. I think it's looking really nice and it's also very, like, super, super efficient. I mean, well, I say very efficient. It's efficient at handling and moving resources around. It's not efficient in processing speed. We still have an issue. <laughs> we still have a processing backlog. But once the resources have been filtered and they end up in, for example, the maceration subnet, they are backed up here as we currently only have one macerator. Um, well, technically we have 64 here, but yeah, there's only one processing array managing the maceration step. For some of them, we have two, like the centrifuges. We have two centrifuges. And I think we, oh no, we only have one electrolyzer. The bottom line is we need more machines and we also need to answer the first question we asked at the very beginning of last episode. I don't know if you'll remember. How many should we start with of each machine? How many is a sensible amount of each machine? I'm kind of thinking like four to start with. Is that too few? Hmm, how many machines? Yes, that is the question. Uh, so before I started this episode, I was just going to keep doing ore processing today and uh, build out as many machines as we decided on. I still don't know how much, how many we're going to go for just yet. But this is GTNH. We need to be a bit smart on how we prioritize things. So for this episode, we're just going to live with the fact that we have slow machinery. Yes, I know one more episode isn't going to hurt anyone, right? Like we've we've dealt with this for so long by now. But we're going to make it easier for Future 3 to build more machinery by investing in auto crafting. It's finally about time that we do something about this mess, about the spaghetti. <laughs> Today is finally the day that we tackle auto crafting and we're going to fix up all these machines here and uh, build a new space in the void for all of our uh, yeah on-demand processes. So just as a quick recap on what we have so far, we have a forming press, a bending machine, a chemical reactor, a solidifier, uh, what is this, uh, extruder? Yeah, this makes us things like rods and bolts and rings and pipe. It's a very uh, versatile machine, this one. Gears as well. We also have um, a lathe, we have circuit assemblers, we have alloy smelters, wire mill, alloy blast furnace, this processing array is for the assembling machine, the one that always gets stuck. <laughs> We're gonna fix it though. Um, laser engraver, uh, we have macerator, fluid canner, fluid heater, distillery, this one is our circuit assembler IV. We have a multi-smelter for on-demand furnace recipes, we have autoclave, chemical bath and compressor. And then finally we have a mixer, an industrial mixing machine. Oh yeah, I guess we have two mixers. We have our IV mixer down here and the IV assembling machine as well. Um, so yeah, that basically is all of the machines we have on demand, if you don't count the blast furnaces already in the void. I briefly touched on the fact that we also have our clean room down here, which also has some on demand um, functionality in the form of a cutting machine and some circuit assemblers, which handle some of the circuits and a lot, basically all of the cutting machine recipes. Wait, there's two circuit assemblers in here. I didn't... Oh, apparently this also does some circuits. Yeah, we have some stuff in here. We uh, we still do need the clean room. I'm not sure if we're going to move this today. But we want to put in the work today to get all the infrastructure laid down, like we did with ore processing. Today is going to be all another infrastructure upgrade episode, and auto crafting. I do know where it's going to go, and it's going to sit right where we are here and we're gonna to expand to the west and to the east. Currently, we've got the blast furnaces making us tungsten as we had run out completely. And we're gonna need tungsten to fluid extract um, as I want to make and separate our power input lines, or sorry, power output lines. Um, so we're gonna craft up another dynamo hatch here. This is the, the very expensive ones that we crafted a few episodes back when we were doing the XL gas turbine. So yeah, 16 amp dynamo hatch, and we also want a 64 amp dynamo hatch. So we need to convert this one more time, or rather upgrade it one more time. So actually we need two insane power transformers, and oh boy. Yeah, we're missing recipes for a lot of this stuff, so 
Some of it I've just been doing manually to avoid having to add recipes, um, because we're out of space in a lot of the pattern, in a lot of the interfaces connected to a lot of these machines, which is one of the big reasons why we have to get this upgraded. So we'll go old school here and do some tool crafting. We need some empty cells, as we're going to need some lubricant. Fortunately, we do have lubricant. Um, we should have that in our AE system. And we can just fill a bunch of cells. Does shift click work with this? Yes, it does. Perfect. Okay, what do we still need? Another high amp transformer. We're out of tungsten wire again. It's, uh, yeah, we have 64 smelted. We, we were down to like one, which is why I ordered like 300, I think. There's still 200 crafting. Let's order another like couple hundred. Nah. We should be patient. <laughs> it's not going to ha happen any faster if we order more. We should just be patient here. Because we are also going to need tungsten steel for uh, today's project as well. And lots of other blast furnace furnace um, ingots. Yeah, we'll use some of it for uh, tungsten wire. You can hear the wire mills. Still haven't added a muffler to that after all this time. Okay, there's two high amp transformers. Two high amp transformers and we're missing some vanadium gallium cable. The AX variant. Um, we only have the 4X variant on Autocraft. Yeah, also coat some of this tungsten cable while we're at it. And the vanadium gallium cable. It's been a while since we've done actual crafting on camera. Like, almost all of it has been cut out recently. There's one of our insane power transformers. We're missing an LV pump. Fortunately, we do have recipes for the pumps. Um, there's the second insane tra power transformer. One of them we have to use, and the other one we're going to use to upgrade the dynamo hatch. So 16 amp IV dynamo hatch, tungsten... I already forgot the recipe. Tungsten steel plating, insane power transformer, and 12x tungsten wire. Yes, there we go. And so yeah, I want to begin here by splitting off our power lines, so that right now on the super capacitor, again, we're, we have two input lines here. This one is LUV coming from this set of turbines and the XL gas turbine. And this one is from basically these five and these five turbines here. This is, this is another IV input line. Um, but I want to split off our output lines and have two. One of them we're going to send to the north and that is going to, or sorry, the south. And that is going to feed our nitro benzene system here and the future auto crafting room, which will be on either side of this walkway. And the other one is going to go north. Um, it's going to follow the existing line, which is already in place here. So this is going to be a huge pain to do because all the power is going to go out once again in every single machine. And we have way more machines than we did the last... Well, not way more, but a couple more than we did the last time. So I'm going to have to go and manually turn them all back on again after we uh, fix this and adjust this. Which is probably one of the reasons I should have done this uh, when we were messing with the turbine. And messing with this power network. Um, but since we're taking it offline, we might as well keep this symmetrical, or try to. And uh, I'm going to move this middle line here. Oh, this is going to this is gonna make a mess. And we'll uh, take out this insane power transformer and the 64 amp IV dynamo hatch. Here. And then we'll add a second one. Yeah. Essentially on the two... There we go. <laughs> that was a bit weird. Yeah, essentially on the two sides, we'll add the dynamo hatch. So pretty much the benefit to doing this is we now have 32 amps um, coming out of our battery. Although we don't generate 32 amps of LUV power, um, we can now send 32 amps of LUV power throughout the base. And that also means we can move this one here as well. This is the insert from the turbine. No, that's right. 64 amp energy hatch. <laughs> I'm having flashbacks again. <laughs> Please, no explosions. Okay, into here. And this is going uh, LUV to IV. This is LUV line. This is our input line. Put this back. And now we have two extraction points, two dynamo hatches, which we're going to transform up to LUV. Right, so two power transformers in transform up mode. Here and here. And now we plug this line back in, and this line back in. Yes, and now instead of connecting them all together, we're going to split them off so that one goes north and one goes south. So we can do that, and we can do that. Connect this one here, and connect this one over here. 
and make sure we do not connect, connect these together because that would send way too many amps through the cable. Yeah, so to recap again here, what we've done is we're now capable of sending 32 amps of LUV throughout the base. This does obviously mean that the battery will drain much faster, but we're making full use of the battery and we're storing power for when the base demands it. Um, and therefore we can send it much more at once, just not necessarily over a sustained period of time. But that is kind of what happens when you request something um, on demand. You need a whole lot of energy at once and then, then again nothing. Well, whatever the passive power drain of the base is, which for us is like 80k, 90k I think, after we added all the applied energistics that we're processing. It's about 90k over 5 seconds. But now, once we go around and switch on all the machines again, <laughs> this is going to be so tedious. Yeah, some of them will have stayed on, but anything that was currently running or drawing power when I broke that cable in the middle is now powered down. And we should really add some machine controllers to these to keep them powered on, but I don't really like doing that because that does void recipes if you are messing with the power network. Because uh, if you do that, it will try to turn on the machine and then stall, void the input, and then immediately try to turn it back on again which is obviously no good when you're trying to mess with the power network, so I prefer it actually without. This one is, is also off for Osmium. We probably voided a, a few ingots there, or a few dusts, a few chemicals in various locations, but yeah, I'll make sure all the machines are turned on here. And then I think we're just going to jump straight into some building here. We're going to need some space for all these machines. We're going to want to have it expandable like we did with ore processing. And <laughs> You feel exhausted? Yeah, thank you, Thumbcraft. Already, <laughs> I have to design a brand new room for this. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be worth it. So uh, yeah, let's do some building and get the groundwork laid down for the auto crafting machines. All right, so we have a good start here. I laid the foundations for auto crafting, but first of all, I spent the last hour crafting another chemical plant. The same machine which makes our nitro benzene fuel. So for most things we had already, and the first time we made this, I did add a lot of the recipe patterns inside our AE system, but still we were missing a few. <laughs> no surprises there. Um, so it was a bit of manual running around uh, to fill the machines, but we managed to get it crafted in the end. Obviously this is a multi-block machine and so the controller on its own is no good. We're going to need um, solid machine casings and this time I opted for titanium to make this tier 5. We need pipe casings. I did cheap out and go for regular steel instead of tungsten steel as the pipe casing tier only affects the amount of parallel recipes the machine can run which is not an important factor for what we need this chemical plant for. We also need coils, um, so we have some nichrome coils that we exchanged from the EBFs in the plat line, so we'll use those. And then finally, other than the buses and hatches, you know like the energy hatch, input bus, output bus, input hatch, output hatch, we also need machine hulls. I thought the minimum we need for the recipe will run is IV, but no, it's only EV, so we have 57 IV machine hulls crafted, which is only around 450 tungsten steel. Um, I'm sure we're going to use the machine hulls, in fact I know we're going to use the machine hulls. Or we can just recycle for the tungsten steel back. But yeah, we only need EV machine casings for this, which is, yeah again, a little over 450 titanium. Which again we had run out of, so more waiting on blast furnaces, lots and lots of waiting. Uh, well, you know, it's good to have dreams every now and then, uh, things you want to accomplish, but Greg always has a way of putting you down. Big Gregorius technology. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, so, uh, yeah, I built out a space here and I was really excited. I'm still really excited to populate this thing, but mm, I don't know for how far we're going to get with this today because, well, we're going to need some extra stuff here. Some extra stuff and it's going to be a rabbit hole and a half, let me tell you guys. <laughs> Starting with this chemical plant which we now have set up here and automated. We're just doing this recipe on demand. Um, but to explain further and to not take forever in this rabbit hole, I think we should uh, try to explain this in a time lapse. Yeah, that could be fun. I think I've got many, many hours ahead of me here <laughs> to dig myself out of this hole. 
Um, no, to tell you guys the truth, I just spent like 15 minutes trying to explain what we need to do here and it just was not working out at all. <laughs> I know some of you guys like the rambling, but I was just away with the fairies as we say here. So I do have a plan laid out here. Let's hope Gregorius T does not foil it once again and we actually achieve our goals. But if I do my job correctly, you guys will understand what's going on. Oh, actually, just a document. I'm currently at 1540 hours played. Oh man, 1500 hours in this world, that is crazy. Okay, we have a lot of work to do here, so let's just begin. Minus the eggs, please, Greg. So many dang chickens all over the place here. So we want to add capability to our auto crafting system, right? Not take away any functionality. So to ensure we do so, we're going to invest in some brand new machinery before we demolish or remove any of the setups from the overworld. And to craft these machines, we're going to use our chemical plant running the recipe for boric acid, made with hydrochloric acid and borax dust. Borax dust we make from bees as well as ore processing, and well, hydrochloric acid is hydrochloric acid. We are using our chemical plant on demand for now and so we can add recipe patterns for all this stuff. And then the boric acid is then mixed with some distilled water and thorium dust, which again is manufactured from ore processing and this gives us some thorium 232 dust. There is other methods to obtain 232 but I think the chemical plant is the best way, which is why I put together a second one here. Mix 232 dust with some elemental dusts found in the twilight forest and we can make arcanite. Arcanite is used to craft a project table and this is the basis of our new machines, the large processing factories. And this thing is a beast, it is super expensive. Not only because of the Arcanite, but it also takes six other separate IV machines to craft each controller. It is a multi-block, so we need the casings and all other things to facilitate its construction. Oh, and I want to make six of them. Do any of you guys ever feel guilty spending resources in your own world? It's like spending money you don't have. <laughs> like we have just spent an insane amount of resources crafting these, what is it, uh, 36 IV machines. Like this is probably the most expensive inventory we've ever held. Combined with our armor, combined with the Vajra, combined with the backpacks. I mean, yeah, there's a reason I've been putting off auto crafting upgrades and this is basically it right here. You know, maybe it's actually not as bad as I'm making it out to be because we haven't crafted a whole lot of expensive machinery lately. We've just been moving the things we have. Um, so most of the cost that we've induced is in uh, things like chemical reactors, which isn't really that bad, and AE components. That's probably the biggest cost in the last few episodes. But yeah, I wanted to bring you guys back here to put together the large processing factories. This is a big moment. <laughs> um, and I realized I haven't actually explained what these things do. Yeah, first of all, let's get these things crafted. So we have our 36 IV machines. We've got the project table. We should have six crafted here made from the Arcanite. A bunch of EV stuff here and the multi-use casing, which is the casing block. I think I requested... Not 64. <laughs> I think I requested 64. Yeah, we have 64. We're going to need way more than that. Um, let's request another two stacks. 
Uh, this isn't actually too bad, it's just a bunch of stainless, titanium and uranium. And we have the recipe for it, of course. And then the, the final thing for the machine controller is Staboloy Platin. Which I just used, actually. That, the, Yeah, this also takes Staboloy Platin. Hold on. And now we've got our large processing factories. Six of them. We don't actually need six, but we're going to craft six. A nine-in-one machine. What a steal. So how is this going to help us with auto-crafting? Well, it's a multi-block machine. It's a 3x3, three three, I believe. Yeah, the multi-use casing, which we're, I should just request here. Let's order another 128 again. So these things, as you can see by the tooltip, I'm not actually 100% sure on how they work. But essentially there's nine different machine types it can be. Um, and you can toggle between type A, type B and type C. So type A is a compressor, a lathe, a polarizer. Type B is a fermenter, a fluid extractor and a regular extractor. And type C is a laser engraver, autoclave and fluid solidifier. So although it says nine in one, I think it can only be uh, one of three different modes. It can be A, B or C, fluid mode, misc mode or metal mode. Um, and you can essentially share the machine types, if I understand correctly. So we definitely didn't need to make six, but I mean, if we're going to do upgrades to auto crafting, we're going to do it properly. So <laughs> I just went ahead and made more than we need. Um, because there is minimum casings for the machine. So that means you can only have so many input buses. And so if, for example, if, for example, the fluid solidifier there on machine type C takes a whole bunch of different, um, what are they called? Molds, I think. And by the way, our fluid solidifier right now is EV. Um, it's this guy right here. And they're all single blocks. Essentially, every, every variant of these machines, the compressor, lathe, polarizer, Fluid Extractor, Regular Extractor, Engraver, Autoclave, and Solidifier. These are all single blocks, like these guys right here. So this is the upgrade to these machines. We have some on the other side here as well. But yeah, back to these molds here. So the Fluid Solidifier, as you know, um, has... Well, <laughs> that is a lot of different recipes. 53,000 recipes. But um, yeah, each of the molds, when you want to Fluid Solidify a fluid, you have to specify what you want to solidify into. And that is done with the molds here. And as far as I know, you can only have one mold per input boss, right? So this is a multi-block instead of the single blocks where you can only have the one mold inside, um, inside of the machine right here. On this one, similar to the way we have our processing array, we can have multiple input bosses. And as far as I understand, you can put the molds in there, right? So we can fluid solidify into turbine blades, for example, into rotors, and then provide the fluid. Wait a minute, no, provide the fluids. That's This is an input bus, so how is that going to work? Unless we can put the mold inside an input hatch. There's no space inside an input hatch, right? Like for items, we can't put the molds in here, so how do we specify what we want to fluid solidify? Unless I can only do one mold? Maybe the fluid solidifier was a bad example for this. Yeah, that I'm not too sure about, but I do know for the... For, for the laser engraver, which we currently have in a processing array right here, the laser engraver is a similar situation to the fluid solidifier in that it takes different molds um, or basically different lenses here. Yeah, this is a better example. So all the different lenses in, the, in this guy right here is in separate input buses, right? So this one here is the green sapphire lens and all the green sapphire lenses are provided or the patterns for the green sapphire lens is provided by this interface. And we have a bunch more underneath here. Like for example, blue topaz, we have Terra. Yeah, a bunch of different lenses and all of those need their own input boss. And as I said, there is a minimum casings for the large processing factory. So we can't just have an infinite amount of input bosses and lenses. Um, and therefore that would take away functionality from some of the other machines, which is why I all this to say, <laughs> all this to say basically is why I crafted extra, is why I crafted six and not just three. So that we can have um, a whole bunch of different input buses for each type of machine. Maybe that was a more concise way to say it, right? <laughs> yeah, is there anything else the quest tells us here? Each of the modes can support three different machines selected by putting a circuit into the same input bus as the items you want to process. Oh, I see. Okay, these are in order and can be used with circuit numbers 20, 21, and 22. Aha, okay. 
Yeah, they're in order. So what that means is um, the compressor is circuit 20, the lathe is circuit 21, and the polarizer is circuit 22. So when you want to use the compressor, you do a circuit 20 here, right? And then supply the pattern into this input bus and make sure it's on the correct mode on the machine controller. I'm going to assume metal mode. Yeah, that would act like the compressor. And uh, it looks like it answers our question down here. You can only fluid solidify one shape per machine. Does that mean per large processing factory? I'm going to assume so. So in that case, I think we're going to have to continue to use fluid solidifier single blocks. And in fact, when I was crafting these uh, multi-block machines, I did have to invest in an, another IV fluid solidifier. And I believe that was for nitinol 60 plating, which is used in the project table craft. And this, for some reason, is an IV fluid solidification recipe. So uh, yeah, error one over there is EV, the one that I've been uh, messing around with, and this actually should have the rotor, rotor uh, mold inside. So yeah, I think I've got a pretty good idea of how we're going to use these, and we can now swap all but the fluid solidifiers with multi-blocks, and the rest we already have, like the multi-smelter, the mixer, we went over these at the beginning of the episode, the wire cutting factory, yeah, the extruder. So what we're going to have to do now is find an appropriate layout for the machines here and uh, also craft up some more energy hatches. I want all of these large processing factories and ideally all the ones in the overworld that we have running at IV. Yeah, actually, just in case we run into any more situations like that 1960 plating uh, where we have minimum of IV, most recipes in the game are... Uh, I mean, you can run most recipes uh, in the game with IV machines, so... It would be nice to upgrade all of these to IV power, especially now that we have all the nitro benzene and we split off the battery so that we're supplying more amps to the new auto crafting section. And uh, yeah, all of these right now are running EV power, so we're going to have to craft more energy hatches. Wait, what is crafting right now? Do we... <laughs> is stuff crafting on its own? We don't have any crafting cards. You guys know how I feel about crafting cards. Oh yeah, it's still, it's, it's the casing still. It's, I think it's because this is a blast furnace recipe, right? And it just takes a while and then it goes through into plating. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, so we are going to need to craft a bunch of IV energy hatches. And in fact, let's uh, determine how many, how many we need. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is already LUV. So eight, nine. Plus an additional five, because the laser engraver is already accounted for, and one of these is going to be a laser engraver. So 14 IV energy hatches. I might just do 16, just a batch craft, and we'll have extra. And the other thing we'll have to figure out is the channel situation here. We are going to need a lot of channels to supply the interfaces uh, for each of these machines. And most of the machines, as I mentioned, are going to have more than one interface uh, for recipe patterns. So we have this line here, which is subnet line. And this feeds the nitrobenzene system. This one line pretty much feeds the whole base, at least everything uh, south of our main AE controller. So we can only have uh, 32 P2P connections on this dense cable. And right now we have 26 of 32. Um, we might just be able to make it work, but I have a feeling very, very soon we're going to have to split this into two different dense cables coming from the subnet to feed the rest of the base with P2P connections. Oh yeah, and of course the other thing here is the transformers. Um, this is LUV of course, and we're going to supply IV power to most of the machines. We might still have a few EV, um, especially the single block solidifiers for some of the uncommon recipes, but yeah, we are going to need a whole bunch of transformers and cable as well. And all this is tungsten steel. All the IV stuff is tungsten steel. Oh, and we're back down to 19 regular tungsten. It also does cost a lot of tungsten cable as well, so let's... Let's do 100 tungsten and like 500 tungsten steel again. I mean, yeah, these blast furnaces have been running pretty much non-stop since the beginning of the episode. And, oh yeah, I guess, well, I've got you guys here. Um, I do intend to make some pretty significant progress on auto crafting today. But uh, maybe we should check up on how ore processing is doing. Because I did um, add a bunch of item conduits here to start to ingest all the items from these chests. So we're getting, we're getting through it slowly. <laughs> um, I wonder how much of it is still in the subnets after it's been filtered. I suspect there's quite a bit still, 
Oh, wow. Wow, every time I come over here, this maceration... Yeah, this macerator is full and it is now empty, which is a good sign. But that just means that we can start to add more things into the input. We still have four chests here. So let's keep the resources flowing. This also means that we're going to have to move the miners as well. Because the miners have finished their operation on... Um, I think there's... They're still on Callisto and... Wait, did I switch this on properly? Is it taking resources? Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, that should all be getting processed right now. Yeah, I think the miners are still on Ganymede and Callisto. These two are missing mining pipe, which means they're finished. And uh, this one here... Wait, did we just catch it right at the end? Wow, what are the chances of that? What are the ch <laughs> What are the chances we catch it right at the end of its cycle? So uh, yeah, that means all of our miners are now finished. Oh yeah, and one more thing I want to show you guys before we get started here is uh, is this. Check this out. <laughs> Look how much oxygen we have. Yeah, like how much even is that? 1.8 G? I mean, that is the power of passive processes right there. That is the power of the crops. Um, yeah, we're making it from sugar beets and then uh, electrolyzing sugar into oxygen. And it's just all cached here in the hatch, so like... I don't suspect we're going to run out of oxygen gas anytime soon. Maybe eventually when it gets really crazy, but uh, for the moment we are covered for oxygen. Anyways, let, yeah, let's stay focused here. The current objective is to move all of these machines. I think I will just go ahead and move everything over. It's going to be such a nightmare um, because, like for example, as we saw, lots of these have so many patterns inside. That was a very bad example. <laughs> like the rods though. And they don't stack either, so I don't know. Yeah, especially for things like the plating and like the extruder, the forming press, those have a lot of recipes. Yeah, again, the power situation and the transformers and the channels. Um, I guess I should probably get those crafted before taking down any machines here. But yeah, I'd say that's about enough procrastination. Let's actually get some machines moved over.
So many clicks here. This is kind of insane. <laughs> I'm gonna have no mouse left. Oh, just think about the end goal three. You can do this. You can absolutely do this. We're almost there. As long as I keep telling myself that, we will eventually, that will eventually become true, right? It has to. It has to. <laughs> oh, I've, I've watched that clip so many times and I'm just, I'm just, I, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to keep that in the video, but man, every time I watch that, I just giggle to myself. But yes, <laughs> yes, many. <laughs> So yeah, as you can see here, we've populated a lot of the machines here in the new auto crafting room or rooms, I guess. I added a second floor to this, which is going to be for some of the bigger multi blocks, um, things like our extruder and the wire factory. And I will admit there's a lot of empty space here, but it means we can grow into it in the future. We have lots and lots of space to expand and add more machinery down the line, as there is still a couple of machines that we're missing for some of the core recipes that we want. So I actually went ahead and split up the machines here into two different sides and there isn't, I mean there is reason for for the placements of some of these machines. Um, maybe let's just go through them. So first of all we have our alloy blast smelter. This is something we're going to have to be messing with in the next couple of episodes because I'm not really sure how we're going to handle alloy blast smelting recipes. Um, so yeah, this is our circuit assembler making it for making circuits um i'll talk about this specific fluid automation in a second but um yeah we also have two assembling machines now i went ahead and crafted a second actually this is our laser engraver pa which now has our iv assembling machine and the other one has two ev assembl assembling machines and i was at this for ages and ages trying to figure out how to automate the assembling machines because a lot of the recipes also take fluids and so I was trying to mess it around with um, like buffer the IO buffers and ME chests and export buses and it just was not working out so we're uh, continuing to use these ingredient buffers so when we want to request something that has both a fluid and an item let's say we want to quote a wire into cable you can see in the recipe we supply 720 drops of molten rubber and also the 16x annealed copper wire. And uh, both of those are supplied via the dual interface into the buffer. The fluid is buffered in the ingredient buffer as well as the item. So this one block here can hold both fluids and items. And then we have conveyor on the input bus into the specific circuit number, in this case 24 to coat wire. And then on the inside we have a fluid pipe going into the input hatch of the machine. And that supplies both the item and the fluid, and then the assembling machine will run the recipe. And for all of these multi-blocks and machines here, we've switched to ME output buses. Uh, I think it's on the top here. Yeah, it's this guy right here, which will collect the output, send it back to the AE system, and complete the craft. The reason though I was messing around with the assembling machine for so long is because um, one of the reasons uh, that our assemb old assembling machine got stuck so much is because of these ingredient buffers. These things I've found will randomly void a tiny amount of fluid um, and so it leaves the recipe not enough to finish the craft and that's why it gets stuck sometimes. Um, other times it was my own fault when it was in the overworld but I haven't had it get, I haven't had it um, freeze up or get stuck so far. But we do want to switch away from these ingredient buffers whenever we can. Unfortunately the solution is gated right now as <laughs> as this is gtnh uh we have a lot of pin pages here maybe yeah some of these are so old some of these were from the rocket you know what let's do let's get rid of all of our pins we have nine pages of pinned recipes let's clean this up a bit we don't need any of these anymore Um, yeah, so the solution to the ingredient buffers we currently don't have access to and we need to craft the assembly line um, and the assembly line is also going to give us access to a way to replace the processing arrays 
Hold on, we have a few more pages to get through here. That was for dense hydrogen. This is for... What is this for? Thalic acid? Get rid of this. Nitrobenzene, that's right, we had all this pinned as well. We don't need it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so many, so many pins. Oh yeah, I've seen some of you guys wondering how you change the view of the pins. You can toggle this to view or change the, the view mode of the bookmarks, which is pretty handy. Couple more to go here. This was from ore processing. Um, yeah, so the assembly line is is the next big progression goal for us, or one of the next big progression goals, and that is going to allow us to craft the precise assembler. I mentioned that a few episodes back, but that is basically a huge multi-block assembling machine, which gives us way more f uh, flexibility than the processing array, and will mean we can get away from these ingredient buffers. Just to refresh your memory, it's uh, this guy right here, the Precise Auto Assembler. Um, and it looks like this, very big multi-block, so I'm thinking that's going to go um, underneath. I've kind of reserved the underneath sections for some of the bigger multi-blocks. Any more pin pages? Yeah, we have two more. And this one we need. So we have uh, four more machines to add. I just noticed here that we're missing a pump on this uh, fluid pipe here. Uh, set this to import. And that should send the fluid from the buffer into the, the hatch down there, which is on the bottom. Uh, but yeah, I also did go ahead and organize most of the assembler recipes as well. So we're no longer sharing circuits. I think there might be only be one which is sharing. Yeah, all of the ones which don't take a circuit I've listed as assembler zero. And I have named all the interfaces as well. So yeah, most of the assembler things are now organized. We have circuit one here. And then, of course, we have circuit one programmed in the input bus. This one here is circuit four and six. This is the only one I think that shares. And the rest should be separated. Yeah, assembler eight, assembler 24 for coat and cable. Another assembler one, which can probably be in, be combined. But we have a lot of assembler one recipes. Assembler two, which is for things like output hatches. And you can see just the amount of recipes that we have just for assembling machines. And then, yeah, another circuit zero here, and that completes the circuits, or the assemblers. The circuit assembler here is slightly different. We, we're able to not use the ingredient buffer. But to explain this automation setup, which is not something we've used before, at least in this configuration, let's go ahead and set up one of the machines which we still have to do, and that is going to be the chemical reactor. So this machine was actually over the other side. I had it built and constructed already, but I decided that I want it over this side. Um, I don't really know why, I just want it. <laughs> I want it over here, but this will give us an example, or I'll be able to show you guys how we're automating items and fluids without the ingredient buffer. And the reason the assembler has to be the ingredient buffer is because of uh, minimum casings and circuit numbers. Hold on, we have to give this thing power as well. Yeah, pretty much everything, as I said, is IV. So we did manage to get all the energy hatches crafted and we're running every machine at IV. With the exception of some of them, the single blocks up here. We have a fluid canner here, which is for making the coolant cells. And this is used in the energy hatch crafts. I think pretty much every energy hatch after MV uses some form of coolant cell. And this is made by canning an empty cell made in the assembler, which we have a recipe for. And then we need also sodium potassium, which is made in the distillery with rock salt and liquid sodium. And this is just fluid heat in uh, regular sodium. So we have those two machines up here, putting that on passive and then it's supplied here. And then uh, on demand, we request the empty can to be sent to this machine and that will uh, fill it with uh, sodium potassium. We also have an alloy smelter here, which is one of the only other single blocks we have still plugged in. Uh, but we only have a few recipes here, so it's not super high on the priority list. Um, we mostly, for alloys, we mostly use the mixer and then we smelt the dust or we uh, yeah use the mixer and then blast furnace the dust. Anyways, getting back to this chemical reactor here, the reason we don't... Actually, this is going to have to be... So what we want to do here is set up a subnet um, so what we're going to do is have a fluid storage bus on 
the input hatch of the machine. Again, the chemical reaction recipes also take fluids and items. Uh, so we have those specified in the patterns, like for example, uh, the recipe for nano CPU wafers. Nano CPU wafers take raw carbon fiber, central processing units, and molten glowstone. So we have all of those being supplied in the recipe pattern right here. And instead of going into an ingredient buffer, which can potentially void fluids, we're instead going to send it into a dual interface. Um, so we're going to do that and basically kiss the two dual interfaces together. Actually, you know what? We should... Yeah, I'm going to move this to the middle of the, of the, the chemical reactor. We'll do it in the middle after all. It's just because we can't place it on dense cable. But um, I kind of want the symmetry of having it in the middle and we'll just filter it in from the top instead. So yeah, again, fluid storage bus, regular storage bus on the input bus. And this is going to go on a subnet. So we have gray, gray colored cable. It doesn't really matter for this. This is just going to be its own little separated subnet, not connected to anything. Um, we're only going to connect it to the main net for power. So we'll do that to plug in the output bus and then quartz fiber to um, connect the subnet and then we'll do our dual interfaces on top here and plug this in into mainnet and the one on the mainnet is going to receive all the all of the recipe patterns so essentially what's going to happen here is well, we need a pattern capacity card and that should be all the recipes okay hold on I, I can't help myself here I need to organize this at least the best that we can all the wafers together, all the circuit boards together. Okay, that will do it for now. Yeah, so what's going to happen here is the fluids and the items can be ingested by a dual interface. And when you do that, when you supply items to a dual interface or a regular interface, um, it's going to go into the buffer slots and then it's going to go into any available storage on the network. We kind of saw this in ore processing. Um, and any available storage here is the storage buses which are connected to the inputs of the machine so that gives the item to the input bus and the fluid to the input hatch in this case a quadruple input hatch and that will allow the chemical reactor to run the recipe and then uh, yeah the output is just going to go to the output bus be sent back to mainnet and complete the craft that way we just have to finish off the machine here and that should be the chemical reactor moved over Right, yes, do the maintenance, turn it on, test the recipe. So let's do the recipe for, oh, I don't know, Eyes of Ender. And we're doing it 16 at a time. Actually, that's a bad example because there's no fluid in this one. Let's do, let's do the nano CPU wafer. Should turn on any second now, right? There we go, 15 seconds, nano CPU wafer. And uh, yeah, that should complete the craft. So yeah, this way we can avoid having to use the ingredient buffer. And this will be our long-term solution for um, things like the chemical reactor. We also have this subnet automation on the autoclave as well, which also takes um, items and fluids. In this case, for the raw Lapitron crystal, which takes molten vibrant alloy. Uh, this recipe right here in the autoclave, which of course is in the large processing factory. And uh, as, I, as I'd kind of thought, it is circuit 21. It does work exactly the way I described um, in the previous section of this video, where you just have to make sure it's on the right mode, in this case, fluid mode, or sorry, MISC mode for the autoclave, and then circuit 21 for the autoclave. But yeah, again, just to be clear, the reason we can't do the subnet here on the assembling machines is because there would be too many input bosses, because we need separate circuit numbers and so you would need a subnet for each one um and so we would need to have like three or four assembling machines at least i think it's just not really a viable strategy for the assembling machine specifically but it's perfect for things like the circuit assembler and the autoclave and the chemical reactor most of the other machines though just work exactly the way you would expect where um basic things like the wire mill just take a specific circuit number so let's find an example here. I think we have a wire recipe, which is like doing a thousand at a time. Let's see if we can find it here. Yeah, here for fine copper wire, we have the recipe set for 1024. So this makes a thousand per every time we request it. And look how fast this is. Let's order like 8,000 copper wire 
check this out. Ten, so 1024 copper ingots turns into 8,000 fine wire. Look how fast this is. And we have it on batch mode as well. 6.4 seconds for 5,000 fine copper wire. <laughs> that is insane. And 3.8 seconds for the last 3,000 and it's done. All 8,000 wire, that is insanely fast. And uh, yeah, the extruder is also works in a basic manner. We just supply the patterns via the interface and then we give the extruder shape to the input boss. And again, let's see if we can find an example for like small gears. We have these set to 128 at once. So 128 fine or small aluminum gears. We already have 200, but let's just request another 200 here. Should be fast enough, right? You can hear the machine. How fast is this? Oh, it's done already. <laughs> yeah, it's done already. Nice. I'm loving that. I'm loving, loving that speed. And a lot of the multi-block machines um, also do receive an energy discount as well. Uh, I believe the large processing factory also benefits from an energy discount. Uh, but yeah, here we have a compressor and polarizer. Here we have a lathe. You guys remember I was complaining about the lathe speed on... That's right, and it was for all this quartz fiber. This took like... This would be stuck on the crafting screen for hours, just crafting this stuff. But look how fast it is now in the lathe. Yeah, look at this. 6.25 seconds for 36, which is really, really good for this recipe. Um, of course, we've overclocked it as well since it's running IV. So yeah, we have our lathe. We have a fluid extractor for fluid extracting ingots into their molten variant. And that is just stored in a dual interface. So we have quite a few recipes in here, and this is just used for things which are going to be immediately consumed by a, a, a different recipe. To give you an example, uh, for, th for crafting uh, things like the coil blocks, all of these take one ingot of molten version of the previous tier of coil. So for HSSS coils, it takes one ingot of HSSG, but molten. Um, so we melt it down here in the fluid extractor, and that just by giving it to a dual interface, it's counted as being on the network. Um, so that allows the assembly machine to pick up the fluid and craft the coil. Next processing factory is the laser engraver. And uh, yeah, we have all of our specific lenses in here. And I moved over all the recipes. I think this is the only one which doesn't have a recipe just yet. Um, and then we're going to use this uh, fluid extractor to change up the way we're doing fluid solidifiers as well. We'll come on to that in a second, but this does also have one more laser recipe as um, in addition. We also have the air lens here, since it didn't fit on the back and I didn't want any cables on the side. So this doubles up just by changing the circuit number inside. So 21 is the laser engraver. And yeah, here, 22 is the fluid solidifier, which is for the rotors. Before we get onto that though, yeah, finally we have the autoclave, which we saw already. We have the bending machine, which again is very, very, very simple. We just supply the recipes and supply the circuit number inside. Again, ME output bus. This one here is the forming press. Similar situation. We have a few block molds here and inscriber presses for some of the applied energistics crafts. And then we have our multi smelter. And yeah, these single blocks we saw already. So up here, I did leave a chest worth of all of the rotor recipes, which have to be adjusted because of the way that we're, uh, yeah, because we're using the large processing factory. Um, before in the overworld, we used to have a fluid extractor connected to the fluid solidifier, making us rotors. But because that is no longer the case, we can't have the recipe supplying ingots. Instead, we have to supply the molten version. So we're going to switch the recipe to this instead. And I guess we'll multiply it by... A few. So yeah, 4,896 is 34 ingots of tungsten steel to give us eight rotors. And we'll have to adjust all of these. So the steel rotor is going to be the same. And I guess we'll multiply it by when we're doing this as well. Might as well do 16 steel rotors. Um, bronze rotors. I don't know if we've got all the rotor recipes that we need. But yeah, again, rotors are used for... I think all the pump recipes use rotors. Yeah, every single pump uses the rotor of the of their respective tiers. Next one is stainless steel. We'll do this uh, again 16 at a time. Next one is stellite. 
I don't know how often we use that, so I think we'll just keep doing that four at a time. Or maybe even one at a time, to be honest. Well, nah, we'll do it four at a time. Next one is tin. This one is used in the LV stuff, so I think actually for this we'll do 64 at a time. Which is 39 buckets worth of molten tin. And that is 272 ingots, which shouldn't be any issue for us. We have loads and loads of tin. Yeah, 35,000 ingots and 62,000 dust. And I assume we have also some cassiterite, maybe. Uh, maybe that's all being smelted already. Final one is titanium, which we'll do, I think, 16 at a time. And so all of these patterns we're going to give to the fluid solidifier large processing factory right here for fluid solidifying rotors. And we'll we'll just test this out just to make sure it works for tungsten steel. Yeah, 34 ingots are going to be sent first of all to the fluid extractor to be turned into their molten variant. And we might be missing a few molten recipes for this, for some of the metals. Like stellite, for example. I don't think we have a fluid extraction recipe for stellite. Uh, but it should be sent to the rotor. Yep, it did blink there momentarily. And did it complete the craft? Yes, it did. Perfect. Let's just test all of these out. So 64 tin rotors, stainless steel, regular steel. Yeah, we're missing a recipe here for molten steel. Which we should be able to add here very easily. We want uh, steel ingot to molten steel. And this will go inside our... I keep forgetting to use the interface terminal. Like, yeah, we have we have so many patterns now. Look at all this. It's insane. <laughs> so many different things making us different recipes. Uh, but this is kind of... Oh, yeah. Just when i seen this, we do also need a forge hammer. Let's add this to our fluid extractor. That should be able to fix the rotor recipe. So I'll make sure all the rotors work. But yeah, coming back to the overworld here, um, checking out what we need and the situation here in this room. We still have one machine to move, the 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 forge hammer, which is still LV, <laughs> making us long rods mostly. Um, so we do need that functionality. We also have a macerator here as well, which has a couple of dust recipes. There's a few recipes we need in here, and we certainly do need a few more macerators in our processing as well. And chickens. Other than that, though, I think we've managed to get rid of all of the other machines here. Let's just double check. There is one more here. What is this? The chemical bath? Do we still need the chemical bath? Ah, yeah, we do. Yeah, we do need the chemical bath for quantumize and quantum stars. So I have a list of machines that we need up here. We need a sledgehammer. We need a alloy smelter, we need a maceration stack for the macerator, we need a cotton factory, and we need a chemical bath, which we'll add to our pin list here. The cotton factory is still in the in here. This is our cotton machines. The cotton factory re replaces these single block cotton machines. So we still have a few things to craft to get all of the basic functionality that we want in auto crafting, but again, this is just the beginning. <laughs> I mean, you've seen how much extra space that we need to fill here. And uh, I was also just reminded a few minutes ago that we also have our implosion compressor, which I left the recipes for in this chest when we took it down. This used to sit next to where the chemical plant is. And in fact, I had to set it up again to get our lathe or to get the large processing factories crafted. So we ran out of industrial diamonds. And so, yeah, I had to make our implosion compressor here again but we can move this over to somewhere next to these machines probably next to the multi smelter here yeah i would say this is a pretty suitable location again some of this might be changed eventually uh, whenever we have more machines and just to accommodate for different things but it's not too difficult to move the locations of different machines so again output boss final thing we need is an interface i think we have a few crafted We'll make it the thin variant, and this will take all the patterns. And yeah, this is basically just for all the recipes which we need to craft rockets. Um, it might be a while before we craft the next rocket, but... I don't know, it kind of depends here. Uh, we'll see. Incomplete structure still. Did I miss a casing on the bottom? I did. There we go. Oh, and let's not forget to name the interface as well. And with that, everyone, I think it's about time we wrap up the episode. I didn't realize actually how long this one was getting. Um, but the the final thing I want to do today is 
clean up our main AE controller. So back when we wired this, I made a decision to do all of the existing overworld P2Ps on the right hand side of the controller and all of the ones in the void base on the left hand side of the controller. So I think we can get rid of all of the ones here. Like all of these are gonna be named OW for overworld. And so most of these now are obsolete. The only one we have to be careful of is the, I think the clean room and then the final three machines, which we have still in this room here, the ones we talked about, right? The forge hammer, the drilling fluid automation and the macerator and chemical bath. But other than that, we don't need any more AE connections and we can very, very soon get rid of this quantum link chamber, which costs us about a thousand EU a tick just to stay active. So we can save a bit of power there, even though we've added way, way more than a thousand EU a tick since that got added to the base. Oh yeah, and I did also have to switch out this uh, subnet line with two dense cables after all, since we have lots and lots of P2Ps now south of the controller. And I was quite inefficient actually with how I set up the P2Ps for now. But again, I built it with future expansion in mind. So I didn't share any of the P2Ps. And so we have a lot of unused channels here, but I'm anticipating a lot more machines and a lot more channels being used in each, each section of this base. So essentially we have what's gonna be four P2Ps for each side of the auto crafting room, one and then two in the middle, which also service the machines down below as well. We also feed the wire down here, um, but with the machines underneath, we might have to add even more P2Ps. So uh, yeah, some of this might be changed, but I did manage to get them all named as well. We kept the naming scheme of the coordinates. So this one is in chunk minus four, minus nine, relative to our main AE controller. Um, so I didn't update the chart just yet, but it, do it should still follow the same rules as the other P2Ps in the base. And maybe just to remind you, I'll show you the existing chart. Uh, maybe I'll update that between episodes, but but yeah, we should be able to go through each P2P here and see which ones are relevant. Like this one here, for example, OW Autocraft 1. Uh, that might still be the Forge Hammer one, so I might just leave that. Yeah, there's still three channels in use there. Like a lot of these, I suspect we can take down. Yeah, OW Fluid Storage, look at this. This is uh, zero channels in use. So this is now irrelevant and we can take those down. Crop process, um, oh yeah, that's right, we still have one or two machines left in crop processing. Um, it's actually for the circuit boards, but yeah, OW, there's the, the clean room one, which still uses eight channels. So actually there might be a few more than I thought, but we might be able to get it all taken offline next episode, as well as potentially crafting all five of these machines here to finish out the stack in auto crafting. And then we can get on to trying to craft the rest of the machines for ore processing, which, I mean, was technically the goal of this episode. Hey, on the positive side, we did manage to empty out all these chests and all of these resources are now processed. And additionally, I did manage to clean up all of the wiring in ore processing as well. It took me quite a while before the episode even started, but I, for I kind of forgot to show that. So I, yeah, I guess I'll show you this room now, now that there's no wiring left. Um, so yeah, we were able to recycle a lot of that and it's now used in the auto crafting room, a lot of the wiring. But yeah, look at this place. It's, uh, it's now a relic, the same as the rest of this base and we can get rid of this. In fact, we should just keep this sign here just to remind us of, <laughs> just to remind us of what we had here. Anyways, guys, that is going to do us for this episode. Thank you all once again for watching and I'll see you all in the next episode of New Horizons.